so far, except in the introduction, uh, I've been discussing the, the question of the real respect to the uh, notion of sexuality uh, it's in its particular ontological status, but now I will introduce the question of how does the sexual difference answer this debate. So, uh, to formulate a couple of uh, questions in this respect, what actually is the relationship between sexual difference and sexuality to poor? Is this relationship accidental or essential? Uh, or which comes first? Uh, is sexuality something that takes place because there is sexual difference? Uh, and perhaps uh, uh, studying the Freud's, uh, Freud's answer is uh, really a unambiguous in this respect and perhaps uh, uh, surprising for in the three essays in the theory of sexuality he insists precisely on the original non-existence of any germ of two sexes or two sexualities in pre-adolescent time uh, I will read you this kind of a outstanding passage uh, the autoerotic activity of the erotogenic zones, he says, however, is the same in both sexes. And owing to this uniformity, there is no possibility of the distinction between the two sexes, such as it arises after puberty. Indeed, if we were able to give, this is the famous line, if we were able to give a more definite connotation to the concepts of masculine and feminine, it would even be possible to maintain that libido is in variably and necessarily of a masculine nature, whatever it occurs in men or in women, and irrespectively of whether its object is a man or a woman. Uh, you see, uh, in, the other, in other words, at the level of the libido, there are no two sexes. And if we were able to say what exactly is masculine and feminine, we would describe it as masculine, for instance. <clears throat> but at the same time, we are precisely not able to do this, as he further emphasizes in the footnote attached to this passage, uh, where he says, it is essential to understand clearly that the concepts masculine and feminine, whose meaning seems so unambiguous to ordinary people, are among the most confused that occur in science. So, when confronted with this question of, of sexual difference, uh, the first answer of psychoanalysis is, from the strictly analytical point of view, there is in fact only one sex or sexuality. Moreover, sexuality is not something that springs from the difference between sexes and is not propelled by any longing for our lost other half, but is originally self-propelling or, as Freud sometimes put it, autoerotic, although this, I think, is not perhaps the best definition. So Freud writes, the sexual drive is, in the first instance, independent of its object, so it doesn't start because of the object, nor is, it, is its origin likely to be due to its object's attractions. And he also adds, which is why, from the point of view of psychoanalysis, the exclusive sexual interest felt by men for women is also a problem that needs elucidation and is not a self-evident fact based upon an attraction that is ultimately of a chemical nature. <clears throat> so, you see, we have at the beginning this kind of a uh, landscape. So, but does this mean then the sexual difference is only and purely a symbolic construction. And here, of course, awaits the other surprise, not related to the first, of course, of the psychoanalytic steps. <coughs> Sexual difference doesn't exist in the symbolic either. More precisely, there is no symbolic account of this difference as sexual. <coughs> this is uh, the crucial point. There is no symbolic account of this difference as sexual. Also, Lacan puts it in the psyche, 
there is nothing by which the subject may situate himself as male or female being. This is from the four fundamental concepts. So, what does it mean? Although clearly the production of meaning of what is to be a man or a woman is certainly symbolic and massive, there is no lack of this, it doesn't amount to producing sexual difference as signifying difference. It is not a signifying difference. So it is precisely a stumbling block of signification. But of course, sex does not function as a stumbling block of meaning because, I don't know, it would be considered morally naughty or uh, it is rather that it is considered, could be considered morally naughty because it is a stumbling block of meaning. And the moral and legal discrimination of sexuality should not, I think, take the path of its naturalization, you know, in the sense of whatever we do sexually, it's only natural. No, there is no na nature precisely of the sexual, not that this is a kind of uh, judgment against it, but you should precisely start from the claim that nothing about human sexuality is natural, least of all sexual activity with the exclusive aim of production. There is no sexual nature of men or women and no sexual being in this sense. So the problem with sexuality is clearly not that it is a remains of nature which resists any definite taming or being caught in the symbolic signifying uh, net, but that, there is he that here there is no nature. It starts with a kind of surplus signification, surplus enjoyment, precisely. No, and now I come back to a point that I keep making from the first day, uh, which is precisely that uh, why is it so crucial for Lacan to establish the difference between being and the real, the fact that the real is not a being or substance, but it's deadlock. And I think this clearly can be illustrated or developed precisely in relationship to what I'm uh, developing today through uh, sexual difference sexuality. It is something inseparable from being, yet it is not being. And one could say that for psychoanalysis, of course, there, it is true, one could say there is no being independent of language or discourse, which is precisely why it often seems compatible with these contemporary forms of nominalism, to call it briefly. So all being is symbolic. It is being in the other, yes. But with a crucial addition, which could be formulated uh, as follows, if I paraphrase an expression by, by Badiou, there is only being in the symbolic, except that there is real. Something like this could be, could be said. So there is real, but this real is no being. It is not simply outside of being, it is not something beside being, it is, as I keep putting it, the very curving of the space of being, it only exists as the inherent contradiction of being. And I think this is precisely why for Lacan the real the real, also the real of the sexual, is the bone in the throat of, um, of ontology. That in order to speak of being qua being, one has to amputate something in being that is not being precise. The real is that which the tradition of ontology has to cut off in order to be able to speak of being qua being, and also to sexualize being precisely in this sense of sexual essences and combinatory of them. So the real this as an additional something that magnetizes and curves the symbolic space of being introduces in it another dynamics which 
in fact, the very dynamics of the symbolics and what makes it also the not all, famous not all. So, but again, to the question of the relationship between sexuality and sexual difference, I think perhaps a very good example or a very good way of getting closer to defining what is the relationship between sexuality as such, its real and sexual difference, is why a quote that I will now read you from John Cobject, uh, in which she makes, I think, a, a very important uh, observation. Uh, she's speaking here about it's a kind of survey of uh, feminism, uh, gender studies in relationship to, to philosophy um, uh, and put in a kind of historical perspective. And she says, uh, the psychoanalytic category of sexual difference was from this day, that is from the mid 80s, deemed, suspect, and largely forsaken in favor of the neutered category of gender, gender, gender sorry. Yes, neutered. I insist on this because it is specifically the sex of sexual difference that dropped out when the term was replaced by gender. Gender theory performed one major feat. It removed the sex from sex sex and the subject of gender besides. While, for while gender theorists continued to speak of sexual practices, they ceased to question what sex or sexuality is. In brief, sex was no longer the subject of an ontological inquiry and reverted instead to being uh, what it was in common parlance. Some vague sort of distinction, but basically a secondary characteristic when applied to the subject. A qualifier added to others, or when applied to an act, something a bit naughty, end of quote. I think this is a very uh, crucial putting a finger or something that actually did took place in this way. And I would like to use this quote as the background against which perhaps uh, the thesis that I'm making can uh, more fully resonate. I would say that it is because, yeah, sorry. Did you write the name? Uh, yeah, uh, I, I'm afraid I don't think this uh, article from where this quote is has already been published. This is from a conference that she gave, but I think it will be uh, probably integrated in his new, her new book, which is coming. John Cotton, but she already published uh, these two amazing books uh, dealing with these questions and the first one is uh, um, what desire uh, read, my desire. read my desire and the other with the I think it's one of the best titles I've ever seen of books imagine there is no woman <laughs> is the, the title <laughs> of, the, of the other book so uh, and uh, in both uh, she's I mean there is this kind of precise and kind of ongoing debate um, with what does, uh, I mean, she's clearly uh, um, someone who adopts the psychometric stance within feminism and tries to, to argue uh, for this and why it is important to preserve this perspective. Um, so, <coughs> my thesis would seem to be the following. Uh, as I said, perhaps uh, sounding more concretely against the background of this quote, it is because it is implicated in sexuality that sexual difference fails to register as symbolic difference. And it's a tautological claim, but I think uh, I should perhaps uh, take things in this way. Indeed, it is true, psychoanalysis does not try to de-essentialize sexual difference. What in its view, de-essentializes it most efficiently and in the real is precisely its implication in sexuality as I defined it uh, in the first hour. That is to, to say precisely as the out of beingness of being. Because it is not simply a difference between two ways of living, two ways of 
I don't know, enjoy into it or whatever, but because it is difference is sexually, both are sexually in this way, it is this that de essentializes it, it to begin with. There, is no, there are no entities with which we can simply start out. Uh, and I think this is uh, what finally uh, psychoanalysis brings out and insists upon. I suppose to a certain extent, if I, uh, precisely to uh, gender differences which are often conceived precisely as differences are any, as any other. There's, there are these differences and that and that and there, there are also gender differences. And which can precisely then miss the point by succeeding too much and falling into the trap of uh, again providing the grounds for some kind of ontological consistency or else complete dismissal of what is the sexual reality. Mm -hmm. so, it might perhaps seem paradoxical, I'm intently uh, going a little bit far here in a provocative sense, but I think that differences that I mentioned in the beginning, like form matter, yin, yang, active, passive, or so on, actually kind of belong to the same ontology as gender differences in the sense that there are differences between different elements. Okay, there is the element of uh, complementarity that is clearly not there in the conception of gender differences, but nevertheless they are seen as entities that can be composed or of which certain symbolic space is composed and between which we can establish differences. So, if one takes, I think, a sexual difference in terms of, uh, simply in terms of gender, one makes it, at least in principle, compatible precisely with mechanisms of its possible ontologization, even if we kind of forbid it or prevent, exclude it as an uh, illegitimate move. But uh, there is no contradiction in principle between, uh, between these two things. And this brings us to the point that uh, I made earlier and to which we can now add a supplementary point, and it is desexualization of ontology. That is to say, ontology no longer being conceived as a combinatory of two masculine and feminine principles, coincides with the sexual appearing as precisely the real, the disruptive point of being. And this is precisely why taking the sexual away as something that has no consequences for the ontological level can open again the path of possible ontological symbolism of sexual difference or again its complete uh, dismissal as something irrelevant. And this is why precisely if one removes sex from sex, as John Kopchak puts it, one removes the very thing that has brought to light the problematic character of sexual difference in the first place. And this is something that is very often missed in this criticism of uh, psychoanalytic take on this. It, of course, it doesn't remove the problem, but it uh, removes the means of seeing it and eventually also tackling with it. And this, of course, clearly implies that, yeah, the sexual difference is a different kind of difference, so to say. It doesn't follow the, because it doesn't follow the differential logic. And uh, I will quote, uh, read you a quote from uh, Mladen Dolar's paper on these uh, topics, uh, which uh, was actually published in a Swiss uh, magazine, uh, this magazine, this Institut für Theorie, uh, which is the title of the uh, paper, is one split into two, and the whole, uh, the whole um, issue of this magazine was dedicated to the fi figure of the two, the, the figure of the two. And I think I already quoted 
part of this, but I will repeat it here because it's really to the point of, makes a good point precisely about what is, the, there is a different kind of difference precisely that one should um, take into account with the notion of sexual difference. So the quote is like this. Uh, there is a widespread criticism going around that aims at the binary oppositions as the locus of enforced sexuality, its regulation, its imposed mouth, its compulsory uh, stricture. By the imposition of the binary code of two sexes, we are subjected to the basic social constraint. But the problem is perhaps rather the opposite. The sexual difference poses the problem of the two precisely because it cannot be reduced to binary opposition nor accounted for in terms of the binary numerical two. It is not a signifying difference, such that it defines the element of structure. It is not to be described in terms of opposing features, nor as a relation of given entities pre-existing the difference. One could say, I think it, this is a crucial formulation, bodies can be counted, sexes cannot. Sex presents a limit to the count of bodies. It cuts them from inside rather than grouping them together under common headings. And I think this uh, resumes very much uh, many things that I was trying to, to develop slowly uh, from the beginning. And of course, we could say that the fact that sexual difference is not a differential difference is, might also explain why actually Lacan, perhaps you know this, he never at no point uses the term sexual difference. It was kind of invented later, introduced into the Lacanian theory even later, but he never speaks, mentions the term sexual difference. Um, and th this fact that it is not a differential difference is also, of course, what can explain why these famous formulas of situations are not differential in any common sense. They don't imply a difference between two kinds of beings. Uh, nor is there a contradiction or an antagonism that exists between what, yes, he formulates as M and F position. I think uh, perhaps one way of looking at it that can take us a bit further from precisely this kind of reading is that contradiction or antagonism is what the two uh, uh, the two positions have in common precisely. It is not something that happens between them. It is what they share. It is the very thing that binds them to a certain extent. It is the very point that kind of accounts for speaking about men and women under the same heading. But this thing that kind of um, uh, not distinguishes them, but, but precisely undistinguishes them. So the, the undivisible that binds them, the irreducible sameness is not precisely again that of being, but that of a contradiction of out, or out of beingness of being. This is also precisely what it means, this famous slogan, there is no sexual relationship. It doesn't mean, you know, as the popular title goes, that men are from Mars and women are from Venus. And that those they can never form a harmonic couple. And sometimes there is a misunderstanding of this formula, which I think is completely wrong. It, it is not something that aims at explaining the war between sexes, the, the war of the roses, the alleged incompatibility of sexes. For precisely these explanations, as you know, they are always full of claims precisely about what is feminine and what is masculine. Something that psychoanalysis precisely denies all knowledge of, as uh, you've seen from the quote in front. So perhaps uh, say that a psychoanalytic claim here is at the same time much more modest and much more radical. Yeah, sexes are not two in any meaningful way. Sexuality does not fall into two parts. Neither does it constitute a one. Simply. It's kind of stuck between no longer one and not exactly two. It, 
it revolves around the fact that the other sex doesn't exist, which is to say that the difference is not ontologicalizable. Yet there is, at the same time, this more than one internal split of the, the one that induces a kind of a crucial uh, difference that could also be, to a certain extent, uh, be thought of as something um, affecting the very ontological way. Okay, this is what I had to do uh, to say about the, the problem of the uh, sexual difference and its relationship to the sexual as such. And now I will just make uh, another point which is perhaps important to be made uh, in this uh, general, after this kind of general presentation of the, what is the real, what is sexuality as related to drive in the psychoanalysis. Uh, because uh, it might seem, um, if you know, all this idea of Freud and clearly uh, continuing in the home that drive is something to, uh, uh, to begin with uh, completely indifferent to, to any other, it is a declination, a kind of uh, cha chaotic turning around the same point and so on. This, all this can give the impression uh, that we are dealing with some kind of profoundly atavist, okay, a social dimension uh, um, that psychoanalysis kind of advocates as the true, really, really real. Um, and so the real that is related here to that, as I said, of antagonism, contradiction, division, split, biasness, fragmentation, something disruptive of being, of organic as well of social links and relations. So there is this kind of a tableau of the drives which may meet either with romantic and enthusiasm, namely that there is this kind of original diversity and dissemination of drives as chaotic heaven of freedom, subsequently tamed by the symbolic norms, differentiations, restrictions, or else, which is also often being the case, it could, could also meet with severe criticism in the sense that uh, what then is the relevance of all this for, let's say, social, political, whatever field? And if this really is kind of a bottom line of what psychoanalysis has to offer, then it has indeed very little to offer us when it comes to, to put it very naively, anything constructive or whatever, collective, politically, or even individually, affirmative. Uh, so I would like to briefly address this question of is this really what actually <coughs> psychoanalysis amounts to when it <coughs> wants to stay true to this real it discovered and conceptualized. And I think uh, the answer, yeah, as you could guess, is no. Mm. And there is a very particular thread of this theory that it doesn't need much interpretation that leads us to support this answer. It already Freud is inambiguous here and Lacan only kind of further elaborated on this. It, is, it would be absolutely false to simply oppose and say the, the real of drives as kind of originally dispersed, fragmented or partial deviation uh, to all forms of binding and unity which are then always forceful, artificial, ideologically or culturally enforced, culturally enforced. So there is absolutely no kind of this uh, duality to, to begin with. And um, I want to make this claim especially because in relation to, uh, to Freud, um, I have proposed some time ago an argument in the book that some of you are see are reading there, uh, which might seem to go in this direction, and this is what I, what I want to clarify. Uh, namely, that if you read Freud, especially the three uh, essays, in the theory of sexuality, uh, what comes around, uh, across is this picture, the so-called normal, healthy human sexuality based on the, you know, what he calls the genital sexual organization and so on, is far from being primordial or 
natural, it is a result, a product of several stages of development involving, involving both psychological maturation of reproductive organs and of course cultural symbolic parameters. So it involves, this is clearly stated in Freud, a kind of subsequent unification of something which is originally heterogeneous, dispersed, always already compound, a sexual drives composed of different partial drives. You know, that he has this kind of a, uh, a theory that also to this day is the source of malaise, this kind of the, uh, children's sexuality as polymorphous per perversion. And this kind of a strong description of what is the, let's say, if you take a historically, of course, the beginning of the sexuality. So this unification then bears two major characteristics. Firstly, it is always somehow forced or artificial unification. It cannot be viewed in the sense that it could not be viewed simply as a natural or teleological result of uh, maturation, of reproductive maturation. And secondly, it is never really fully achieved or accomplished, which is to say that it never transforms all the sexual drive into kind of organic unity with all it components ultimately serving one and the same purpose. Rather the contrary, human sexuality is and remains sexual precisely insofar as this unification, the tying of all these drives into one organization, purpose, never really works, but always allows for different partial drives to continue their circular self-perpetuating activity. So this is this account that I already so, there is nothing in this outline that I would not repeat again here, but I uh, would like to add something else, one supplementary emphasis uh, concerning this point. So if, on the other hand, yeah, the partial nature of drugs is indeed opposed to any uh, idea of the original organic unity, as well as also to the idea that drives are somehow propelling the subject to unite with others, to form ties with other subjects, and so on. It is foreign to both this, it is true. But it is also the fact that whenever this kind of tie or relationship takes place, it is always necessarily thanks to this or that partial object, as Freud called it, partial drive, in the very contingency its articulation. And I think this is the crucial uh, continuation of, of what I've been developing. So this is already the basic Freudian lesson in relation to the drive. I mean that what seems to be or simply what is the main obstacle to the so supposedly natural existence of forming ties and unity and so on is always what in the end makes the later possible. The, the poison is also the cure, as we said. So what structurally stays in the way of an organic unity is precisely what is constitutively involved in different forms of okay, social unity and also uh, intimate violence, for instance, of love. So and this, is, uh, this is what I uh, referred to in the beginning because it is intimate non-relation between uh, ontology and the real. So it is not that real is an organic chaotic diversity subsequently, I but never fully normalized and normativized by symbolic or the discursive and its other. The original character of deviation and diversity is not pre symbolic, it is coexistence, co coextensive, sorry, with the symbolic, <coughs> with the latter always being more than it is. And so partial drives are partial ob and partial objects are not partial because they are kind of taken from a greater whole into which they could be then ideally re-included. They are partial to begin with and to stay. And the, the unity of binding to which they possibly give place is not that of complementing uh, what they lack, for again, they lack nothing, 
Their partial character is not a form of lack. This is very important. It is based on their very partiality and made possible by it. So, or as Lacan puts it in one formula, um, sexuality, here referring precisely to sexual relations, which of course do take place, as such only comes into play, exercises its proper activity through the mediation, paradoxical as that may seem, of the partial drives. You can see the effective sense that the encounters also, uh, between people, the love encounters, happen thanks to the role played precisely by also the partial drives and their object and the open, the, the very gap that they introduce in the space, let's say, between, between the two. And the same is true, of course, for the forming of the social ties of what Lacan calls the, the discursiveness in which, if you remember, if you know that the famous four formulas of the discourse, this element of small a, which is precisely the letter that uh, stands there for this dimension is included. So it is not, for all social ties, this partial object is absolutely necessary. Then it doesn't function in the same way in all the, uh, in all the discourses. But it's absolutely crucial that on some point, as I said before, one has to see this, uh, whatever, obstacle, structural obstacle, how it, at the same time, functions precisely at what, what is included in all um, forming precisely of the social and also intimate ties. Okay, I will now stop here um, and first take questions and then we will see if we move on with this. this. Just limit to Freud. Uh, I think he's. I think he's really clear at the, the uh, in the sense of all these quotes that I, I read. I read you. Uh, this is something that uh, for him is the basic thing. This is what kind of psychoanalysis deals with or it discards to begin with. Then the theory of what happens afterwards in puberty or, or later on is something that of which also he, he proposes different versions, including you know, the famous or unfamous stage uh, development and so on, which is, I think, not the best way of, uh, of approaching this. But nevertheless, of course, the question for him was also how it happens that starting from this, we then end up uh, in this way. And also, why is it that although we end up in this way, this way seems to simply perpetuate the same problem. It doesn't really solve it. It's not that we have some problem first and then there is this solution and then we more or less, less live happily ever after. It is precisely why is it that all this discomfort is produced precisely on the level of the solution of this problem, which it seems the solution itself generates the new problems of deviances, which it then tries to re, uh, re uh, integrate in its own uh, way. So I think what he uh, really discovered here is um, what I, I said before, that to what extent uh, the sexual is really a problem and not the answer or solution to any question. And uh, that, that sexual difference is definitely part of this. That, and so uh, I would perhaps simply repeat this fact that yes, of course, there is this massive uh, symbolic discursive production of what it means 
to be a woman or a man or what it means, what these essences should look like. Of course, different in different cultures. Uh, but nevertheless, what is interesting is precisely then once posted it in this way, what drops out is necessarily precisely the sexual because it's not there. It, it cannot be, and I think there is a certain a certain intimate connection uh, um, precisely between this fact, uh, which could be seen also as something that actually propels or it's very active in this repetitiously massive production attempt to produce uh, uh, to define what exactly is feminine and masculine. And I think this kind of brings us back also to, uh, to one uh, point that I was making in previous days, you know, this uh, reversal that it's actually the, uh, the, the suppression, uh, repression, it's not the result of suppression, but it's the, the vice versa. So that, that we can think about a certain, that we should think about a certain deadlock that explains, not that it justifies, but that explains certain ways in which suppression in the sense uh, works, which can then perhaps help us to modify something. There's a thing you could do of this way. Yeah, I think it's very continue this uh, talk on the sexual difference, yes? This is not the end, yes? It was meant to be the end, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. So, uh, so I'm going to ask this, you know, in the, in, the, in, the, in the sense that, uh, you know, Lacan's sexual relationship basically doesn't exist, but I think you and Gigi agreed in the way that, you know, we have to move from this notion as if there is no relationship to the one that which says that there is a non-relationship. Which, uh, which is, you know, from, mm -hmm. like, you know, from moving from uh, yeah. uh, negative judgment to sort of infinite judgment, you know, mm -hmm. in the sense of, of uh, like, in yeah, yeah. But, uh, but then I think Zizek goes on to speak about that this means that there are not actually two sexes, but there is actually three. So that this non-relationship means that, you know, it's not just men and women, but it's, there is also another, another, involved, but I think it was very vague, like, well, I couldn't get what he was uh, driving at, because... Uh, this I wouldn't know, frankly, uh, for it's the first time that I hear it. Yeah, I mean, he says, uh, he says something like this, you know, he says, it, it, it says uh, like, is it enough to say that there is no sexual relationship, or we should say that there is a non-relationship? No, this part I understand, but what yeah, I don't I mean, understand is this move, that this yeah. means that there is a third... Yeah, uh, it's just like the two following. Uh -huh, sorry, sorry. That, that there is an object that possibly embodies non-relationship. There is no relationship between the two is because there are always three sexes. And then he goes on to say class struggle is never between the two but something more. We only get class struggle because there are more than two. And then mm -hmm. he stops and goes to, you know, cons, which is different. Yeah, know? yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I, I uh, I would need to look to the con uh, larger context of this, but uh, from the immediate response would be, okay, what he calls here the third sex is, of course, what precisely uh, I tried to formulate as the very dis the sex as the impossible that structures the, the field of the uh, sexual difference, or the, 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 the oh. field of the... So it's uh, perhaps, yeah, one way of putting it, it's precisely that this Third, it's a kind of a, what Freud called the libertas terror, that this kind of a, so what stands in the way of the two is precisely this third thing, which clearly, yeah, it is related to the sexual, but okay, to, to call it the sex, I don't know, I, and I also think, I don't know, from what I know of uh, what he's doing, I think I have a particular picture, it's usually also constructed in a way in which uh, this third element, this, in its very positivity, is not exactly situated in the same level of, uh, as this difference. I mean, it's, so I, it, it, what passes me a little bit in this um, conclusion or this quote is precisely that it seems that all of a sudden now these things appear on the same on the same level, mm -hmm. which uh, I'm not sure how to. Uh, no, but in a way, it is supposed to embody the non-relationship. I mean, 
What is that supposed to mean? You know, because it's like, I think it follows where he says, you know, for instance, a big man, but... No, I think what he, fo I mean, what he does there, I mean, this is, uh, um, this is an argument that I uh, developed really in extenso, uh, also in this comedy book, around the, the question of the, uh, this, whatever, uh, incredibly, obsessively reoccurring phallic element in the comedies and also in relationship to the object that we can speak about, that this, whatever, in incarnates this surplus mm -hmm. enjoyment uh, is something that actually comes between the two sexes, between me and, to, to begin with, between me and me, and then also between me and the other with whom I'm supposed to have this kind of relationship. So the, there is this kind of third element which, in fact, could be seen as the very embodiment, as a positive way of saying not simply there is no relationship, but this is the very non-relationship incarnated. It is this irreducible positive object that is actually precisely preventing me from form any kind of uh, organic unity. On the other hand, it is also what ultimately will lead to establishing some kind of unity. And actually, I think uh, there is a way of picturing uh, this uh, out of, out of uh, Plato, you know, this famous myth uh, of Aristophanes that uh, cutting the uh, surround human beings in two, and that this then accounts for the, 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 the sexual drive according to Plato. Uh, but I think uh, if you read this passage that also Freud uses and so more closely, what is really interesting in, uh, in the way how uh, in this myth uh, the birth of sexuality is described, it's not simply that, okay, you have this, first these around human beings who are composed of both male, female, two males, two females, they were all combinations, and they were kind of round, fulfilled, satisfied, and so on, and then uh, Zeus cut them in half to punish their, uh, their arrogant behavior. And it's not simply that, that okay, now they're cut in half, and they're, now they are longing for their other half, which would be this theory that Freud dismisses as saying sexuality does not start because we are longing for some forever lost other half. But what is interesting that the myth goes on to say that in this way this is just the first stage. They were cut in half, they were longing for the other halves and they were dying all the time because they would not, they either they could not find their other half or, or else when they did there was this kind of a obscure fusion, fusing together that occurred, they were just hang into each other and die in, in hands. And so the Zeus saw that this is not working, actually, that this punishment is kind of uh, going in a strange way. And what happens then, and this, I think, it's a really interesting, crucial data. This de uh, data detail is that another cut intervenes in which he actually moves sexual organs which were uh, before on the outside, because they were kind of casting seeds in the, in the earth, the procreation was precisely this kind of a natural, it didn't pr present any obstacle to this being loving each other because it was clearly separated from the procreation, they, they were just, they would um, reproduce, procreate by casting seeds in the, in the earth, in the ground. So what he does then is that he kind of removes the genitals in front and all of a sudden now uh, and there is this incredible line in Plato in which he says so that if they were now that if they will not be able to find satisfaction uh, really infusing together at least they will have some satisfaction and pleasure something to, uh, clearly referring to I don't know acts of masturbating and so on so but the image that this surveys is that now there is this thing that is actually literally put between the two sexes, something that was out of the picture before, which at the same time clearly separates them, each of them from their own enjoyment, because the idea is precisely that the enjoyment now becomes something uh, autonomous, the enjoyment, not simply procreation. So one can have satisfaction in intercourse, says Platon, and then come and get back to one's work. Uh, but at the same time, so it is something that comes, literally comes between the two, and Se se separate them and at the same time constitute the only possible link between them. And in this sense, I think one can say that it is a non-relationship incarnated. I mean, the very, if you want to put it in the very phallic signifier, is the non-relationship incarnated or the object as surplus of is the very 
uh, non-relationship incarnated. So it's the other way of uh, uh, formulating or not formulating this simply in a kind of this negative way, which then induces this uh, uh, understanding that I mentioned. That it's about uh, what difference is so much uh, psychology, <coughs> psychology of women and all this kind of uh, bullshit. So, um, so, I mean, this is the way I could uh, understand perhaps what is. I kind of want to know why you agree with Lacan that sexual differences is the only kind of eventual difference, the only difference that can sort of retroactively affect being and make it be. Because, you know, I mean, even Badu and even Nietzsche, let's yeah, say, yeah. but they both consider other deployments of being than, than sexual difference that are legitimate, that are true, <laughs> or that are real, real differences, real eventual differences that don't have to be sexual. Yeah, I mean, I know this question is recurring, of course. Uh, but what I what I think, uh, why I think onto this is that I think that uh, the very logic of this kind of differences, what what it means, was discovered first by psychoanalysis, and it was discovered by its uh, technical conceptualization precisely of the sexual. I think that there is something to be said about it. Um, it is true that the same logic can, can be found, and that I don't think that Nietzsche has it spelled out in this way. Uh, uh, it's, I think, as I tried to uh, emphasize at some point, I don't think that uh, you know that sexuality is something that is independent of the very logic of the real that was invented through the study of the relations. So it's not simply that we have this logic and then someone puts this in its and says it's this. Uh, sexuality, but you says it's this, Nietzsche says it's that. Mm -hmm. For me, I, I mean, okay, this I could be completely wrong, but I really strongly believe that something happened, and this is why for me uh, psychotic discovery is important, and, and why one should resist this perpetual attempt to culturalize it and say, okay, it discovered great important things, but why don't we just swept under the carpet this slightly disturbing notions of know, sexuality, castration, why not replace it with I know, limitations of our being or this or that. Because I think this way we precisely eliminate the very path it is crucial that led to the discovery of a certain logic, of a certain new logic, of a certain new uh, on differently curved topological space which is different. And I think in this sense, not in the sense that uh, it would claim that the sexual difference is a kind of um, uh, ultimate substance or underlying principle, uh, underlying all this eventual difference, be it class difference, be it whatever. But I, I, I would simply say that I tend to start there or go from there on because I think it is precisely why this, why this phenomenon that it was first fully conceptually articulated or, or formalized in a way that at least I could recognize as something. Uh, conceptual that I have in hand. So then, of course, yeah, the, there are way, other ways of uh, doing it, but here I think uh, there is some kind of a uh, my fidelity to what I perceive as a uh, event in thought that was a movement of psychoanalysis, that it did bring something, that it articulated something that is not simply referring to uh, its feud, its, I don't know, concrete practice, but that it has uh, larger implications and that it contributed something to, let's say, the, uh, the thinking in more general terms. But okay, this is clearly, I mean, I do phonetically believe this, this is for sure, yeah. Just to, like, stand up for Nietzsche for a little bit, I mean, throughout his philosophy... Yeah, he's going to as well. <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> but I, I thought I might let it ride, but if you're going to, go... No, 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 I'm, I'm, but I'm saying that, I mean, if you look at of all the philosophers, I think Nietzsche is one of the, the most prominent ones who brings sexuality with philosophy. Like, you don't see a kind of distinction between the high and low in some of his formulations. Like, truth is a woman. Um, he has a, one aphorism, which is like, man's sexuality reaches to the highest pinnacle of the spirit. And then all this stuff he talks about where philosophy for him is something which is somehow um, has this kind of shameful aspect to it, which is 
I, I think, and, and all the comments about women that he makes. I mean, I don't think um, it's that simple to say that he, he separates sexuality from the other deployments of being here. I think for him very much, sexuality and, and even the will to power and those things are he, very he, much uh, he doesn't relate to... He doesn't separate them in a way, I don't think, he doesn't separate, he doesn't ask the question of other deployments of being sexual by simply relegating sexual difference to something false or something still just not quite getting it. This is what's really going on in life. No, he, I think he acknowledges the, he, the very profundity of sexual difference. He acknowledges the very profundity of Christ and Wagner. And I think his Zarathustra is exactly to exemplify the affirmative dimension of sexuality and that it is, it is a will to power for Nietzsche. But especially in his later work where he starts saying, you know, I am the antichrist, the anti-ass. He, I think he's already, while giving the ass, he's not, he's not just relegating it to something false, but I think he's legitimately asking whether there could be other deployments of being without relegating sexual difference to some kind of false difference or still just not quite true. Not Without relegating some kind of cultural phenomenon or something, Nietzsche never negates. That would be a false, dirty negation. He never negates at the level of uncleanliness. He negates what is true. If he's going to negate, it's going to be what is true. No dirtiness, no simple negations there. Yeah, no, I'm but just, it just like, what it, other... it means we have to take his final words, especially A.K. Homo, absolutely literally. Because I think what's actually at stake here, um, and this is what I think is at stake, I mean, really might be the sort of destiny of a body. Because what is being affirmed in sexual difference is a true, is a true body, but it's the sick body. And a sick body for Nietzsche, that is still true. It's not sick by virtue of just being false. No, truth itself is sickness and sexuality. That's what's crooked. Um, but the destiny of a body, he's considering what a healthy body might be. As far as what human being is, that's not healthy. And it's most affirmative dimension. It's comedic. It's a subject. It's true. It's his will to power. But there could be another destiny of a body. So I think really what's at stake in this discussion is the status of a body. And perhaps, finally, finally, different types of body. Body that isn't just the community body. Body that isn't just body politic. And we can finally first start taking what a body is literally. I think, and that's really what Greek said. Uh, what Greek said. What Nietzsche said about the Greeks is that you really can't take the Greeks literally enough. And you know, when bad you, <laughs> what bad you calls Greek, I think Nietzsche would also call it dirty Greek because you see how he infects the Greeks with Plato. Like the perfect finitude actually turns into a possible finitude. And Nietzsche would say, no, that was not a pure finitude to begin with. So there's what is at stake is the capacity to take a body absolutely literally, and you, when it will, you can do that, that bodies can differ typologically in type, and that those are true differences. I think I just ran out of steam there. <laughs> no, but thank you very much. I mean, you, you uh, clearly formulated very uh, several crucial points, and I think uh, one way perhaps of, uh, of responding to... Uh, to, to your question, to your original question, would be to say that pre uh, precisely what I try to argue is that uh, it is not simply about uh, sexual deployment of being. Uh, okay, you say sexual deployment of being, it's not the only possible deployment of being. What I want to say or to argue is precisely that uh, uh, the, the sexual, and what if this is what it, why it makes it this kind of. Per a reoccurring insisting uh, really in a con is that it has to be situated precisely on the two levels. It is not simply about the sexual deployment of being, it is about what makes sexual or any other deployment of being in boys possible to begin with. So there is, I think, this is why I can keep getting back to the question of whether we can, we should or perhaps can uh, formulate this on the uh, ontological level. So sexual would be in this sense sexual in the sense of okay, the drive, precisely <coughs> of this gap, sexuality through sexuality, psychoanalysis came to formalize, to conceptualize a certain gap in being, which then allows for sexual, which could be then reoccur at this level, but as something else, sexual development, the deployment of being, or else as any other deployment of being. So which brings us back to the question, whether this simply means the fact that there is this gap, 
now call it sexual whatever, does this mean by definition that body is sick? And this, I think it's a very important question because in here I think Nietzsche is really going in like from one side to the other. Does it mean that if there is this kind of a gap that makes precisely body not coincide with itself and which uh, allows for it, uh, for the possibility for it to be engaged, if you want, in reduced terms to the infinite procedure or whatever, is this already sickness? And uh, we should have a healed body without this, uh, this gap? Or is it uh, simply something that uh, one cannot uh, do away with and which one can, I mean, that these other possibilities are then uh, based, nevertheless, on this, uh, on this gap bit completely reformulated or whatever. So I think this, uh, this indeed is a very important question. And, uh, uh, what is, uh, because it, the question is precisely what is, is it, what, for me this is a, the crucial question, what in the body is, what allows for its different deployment mm -hmm. or being. Uh, so it, it somehow uh, I have the impression that one should try to concept or, or at least raise this question. It's not simply that there must be have something already at this level of being, which I call them, okay, inconsistent with, which then allows for its different deployments. And it's, so it's kind of a, yeah. To no, yeah. I think when I already say deployment of being, I'm already talking about that sort of retroaction. That is, if, if sexual, sexuality is already a split from being, the truth you're interested in is that that's only because being is already split from itself. Is that sort of what you're saying? Uh, yeah, to a certain extent, yeah. And that's really the truth that you're, that you're, that you that you are hanging on to, and that's why you stick yeah, with yeah. Lacan because you think that's what's being articulated in Lacan. It's really not quite so much in Nietzsche, um, but I think that that truth, I think that is exactly coextensive with what Nietzsche calls body. So there's not there's not, and I think when we start to get into maybe Lacan, but certainly with Badiou, body sort of gets relegated to what is called body, and it's mm -hmm. not that original truth that's already that could just be being. I think body could just be being. No, but I, I, okay, I, I, I agree. I mean, this is because you slightly changed the argument. I, uh, because now you're saying that to a certain extent, uh, Nietzsche also uh, discovered this kind of logic of precisely uh, 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 gap in deployment of being through uh, sexuality or whatever what uh, uh, he was doing. So I think it's to a certain extent. Uh, I, I very much agree this is in Nietzsche and I think this is very much what makes Nietzsche Nietzsche and what makes him so interesting uh, but I nevertheless think that perhaps I don't know this okay it's a matter of uh, of interpretation but I think that there is perhaps um, the, the very it is not so directly conceptualized uh, in Nietzsche it, the, this logic is clearly there it is present uh, what is not so much a present, it's a kind of a uh, thing that Nietzsche was a little bit reluctant uh, to, to begin with, which would be a kind of a concept of, of this thing. So, because I don't think it's simply, it is of course related to the will to power, but will to power it's also something else. So it's, uh, um, it is, yeah, I said, I definitely agree that there is, I'm not saying that Nietzsche did not uh, see this, but I'm not saying that the fact that, he, uh, that this simply means that he, what he saw was something different, or that, that already originally he was describing or thinking this out of something different. This I'm not sure that one can simply say, it. but okay. I mean, it's, you know. So it seems <coughs> that the approach in, in uh, scanning these different sources of information or ideas or or concepts, or um, it, it, from your approach, is really dimensional. In some ways, it, it's a approach as a methodology of structures at where they 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 meet and trying to learn um, from juxtaposition or, or stabilizing or destabilizing, considering things from many different angles, and and so to take that dimensional approach in, on these particular subjects, it seems that there's a possibility to go much further um, in the sense that some of the propositions 
um, of Lacan and Freud are very questionable. You talked about them in, in the course mm -hmm. today. Um, whether um, just in terms of sexuality, it, there has to be a presupposition that these facts about, say, amoebic, non-sexual, asexual, other kinds of uh, experiences, whether a dog is pleasuring himself, you know, uh, in one way or another, with or without a partner, uh, and uh, understanding reproduction uh, in perhaps romantic terms, is it really the thing to long for to be back in the womb? There are other ideas about this. You know, the Tibetans don't believe this. They say that's the most uncomfortable place that a human experiences in coming forth is one of the most violent things that we experience. Um, and so I think there are some considerations where uh, um, the platform that's established to, to consider these, these questions, um, are, there are foundations for that pr platform in Lacan and Freud that are especially problematic, um, that can be looked at from different perspectives and other alternatives can be proposed that, that perhaps even discount the perceptions. And even in terms of Freud's perspectives on, on humanity, um, what it is that, that uh, we are ontologically. I mean, I, I could look at that and say, that's a very disturbing and disturbed view of what it is to be, uh, to be a human. Um, and, and on the other side, that many of those, it, it, it seems impossible to deal with Lacan and Ford without thinking of their work as applied, um, that it has application in the world. And if you, if, if you do take the dimensional approach to looking at these things, then it seems then that you must take an evaluative approach, which is a philosophical approach, I would think. Um, uh, not, not just, but, but it can be analyzed in social, political, economic, or social uh, um, uh, psychology terms. Um, so if the, the question of the ties that bind a, a family or a community together that have sexual uh, manifestations, then how has Freud's or Lacan's uh, <coughs> intervention into those uh, ties and relationships over the and all of the the descendants of their um, arguments, how have 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 those interventions actually affected um, those ties and relations, either positively or adversely? So that you could ask them maybe what seems like an outlandish question, like. Is this fascination with sexual um, serial killers uh, and and the propagation of that into a media phenomenon an unforeseen collateral damage um, because of problems in this kind of thinking that have not been addressed by evaluation at a place where they could have maybe been corrected or qualified in some other way that could have been more productive. Uh, so there, is there a moral component or is there a social um, structural component to, to, to thinking about these things that, that would be helpful for everyone who has to question whether sex means nothing. I mean, you could reduce that whole argument to like, it doesn't matter that I'm a man. That might be wrong, but it's also a possible outcome for, for, for the line of thought, uh, especially if, if, if it's taken out of context as a proposition or a conjecture. So. Okay, lots of things have been uh, brought up, so I will just try to um, address some. The first, one point of clarification, if I understood your uh, question or objection correctly, uh, I think that what I said about the the ties, you mentioned family ties, or this, uh, collective ties. Uh, my point was not that what actually finally makes them is a 
sexual component in the sense that you you want now. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that it is always it has to do with sex. The fact that uh, it is uh, the other way around. It is precisely that uh, what I started to say that the, the sexuality as such as we on this let's say uh, now make the rough distinction on the. Uh, um, not ontological, but at the phenomenal level, it is precisely um, in only possible if it is already sexualized, and it is sexualized but so by something that is not sexual to begin with. I mean, if we take sexual as something that is related uh, in this primary sense to whatever, sexual organs or whatever. So uh, the, the, the bizarre, the interesting point for me, it is precisely that Front, there is this other supplementary satisfaction. This is how he, you know, how he develops the, 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 the theory of the drive, is that all organs, whatever in their functioning, uh, there is something uh, that is produced in the very process of the satisfaction, whatever of, of supposed to be natural need, which is another kind of satisfaction. This has nothing to do with the sexual in the, let's say, uh, common use of the term. It is, uh, it is a certain surplus satisfaction that uh, takes place first as part of some satisfaction of some whatever uh, natural uh, need, and which then can become an independent goal uh, of in itself the, to find precisely this satisfaction. To put it very bluntly, uh, not only okay, I'm eating, <coughs> but uh, what I when I become, uh, start eating enormously and all the time, it is not simply forced because I'm hungry or, okay, there could be some kind of psychological, emotional explanations, of course, but there is also all these psychological explanations, which, you know, sometimes when they are neglected by parents, whatever, do not, cannot really function if there were not really already this support of the drive, which is to say that to do this, to put things into mouth in order to return to this satisfaction of the mouth itself, not the satisfaction of the meat or whatever. There is certain mechanism, certain automatism of something that uh, gets its own life from this point on and on which or in relation to which all kinds of representations, whatever, functions and so on can be related. So uh, when I'm saying, this is just to say that when I'm saying that there is this partial object that is crucial in forming also the social family ties, it's not meant that because there is some kind of a sexual uh, desire in ties and all this, uh, there is, one could say, enjoyment in the sense precisely which is not immediately sexual, but which is the very element that sexualizes what is not sexual. So I think there is a more uh, interesting <coughs> way which precisely does, it, I don't know, I, instead of just saying, okay, why don't we simply uh, start somewhere else and uh, start building, uh, speaking about these things from uh, in completely other terms. Uh, yes, why not? But I, at the same time, I don't see why it is uh, why this would be better way than really try to think through the concepts that are there and that already uh, allow us this. Because at the same time, I also see. I'm not sure if I. Uh, got your first point correctly, but of course we can say this, we can say this is all wrong, and this, and we have, we can say we can different theories, different approaches, different cultures, different civilizations, but I don't think this stance in itself has any weight, I mean, this is a kind of a empty, I, I don't even see from where it could be uttered, I think it's always already, we always already speak from a certain, yeah, uh, position within this uh, field structure through all these kind of uh, perspectives and uh, and cultures, and there is no way uh, around uh, this. Simply, in a sense, I mean, I, I don't see any point in simply relativizing thing. I think uh, each one who occupies this or this stance is, yeah, striving to make his or her own point uh, heard as the one who is able to articulate things in, in a way that that makes sense. But it's not. Uh, that as if we had uh, some kind of an abstract choice between this kind of, uh, uh, of paradigms, because to a certain extent what we do and how we think this is not at all, of course, independent on also on uh, where we stand in, uh, to the, in these positions. And in relation to, to think, and this is perhaps 
I'm sorry, it's a little bit of digression, but it's in relationship perhaps to previous question. One of the things why I have this kind of almost uh, um, ethical obligation to keep getting back to the theme of uh, sexuality in the in psychoanalysis, precisely in view of, you know, the psychoanalysis became uh, very popular, especially the Kenyan psychoanalysis all over the place, and it's used um, in many different ways, but its, uh, its popularity amounts uh, uh, in proportion to, to the what point is, it dismisses this kind of a direct references to, 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 to whatever body, sexuality, this kind of, uh, what also to the, to the point to which it dismisses Freud to a certain extent, and just goes from Lacan on as if this, it started there. So, uh, and, uh, and why, why I keep insisting on this is that I think um, as, uh, as, I don't know, as Althusser put it very well, in a field that is antagonistic to begin with, and I think the field that we are speaking about is, okay, we could disagree there also, but okay, this is the point, one cannot see everything from everywhere. It depends, I mean, not all points of view are the same. There are certain points of view which, from which this antagonism could be clear, more silly in the certain from which it cannot. And I think uh, sexuality in this difficult, precise sense that I want to uh, come to and uh, bring forward is precisely the point of view from which it was possible to uh, see and to conceptualize the certain nature of, the certain fundamental nature of, of uh, antagonism. And this is why, I mean, this is in explanation to, to this. Now then, to the question if there are other social components that should be taken into account when um, explaining all the different phenomena. Yes, of course, I mean, it's not, once again, I'm not saying it's precisely what per allows us to see not only that there are many social components, but also that they're always structured in a certain way and they're structured in a way that itself merits uh, our uh, theoretical and practical attention. So if other things, other roles, that get, absolutely the fact that, you, as you said, you are a man, is it indifferent or not? Of course it is not indifferent. I mean, this is, I, I really cannot simply uh, see to what extent you could see, take this conclusion that from what I said, it means that finally we can simply say that this is uh, irrelevant. Of course it is not. In the, in the situation, which it is never irrelevant, but the fact why it is ir not irrelevant can perhaps be explained or see, see more uh, clearly uh, through uh, these considerations precisely. And so, I don't know, I, I don't know. Just so much to agree with, I think you should just have a bit more patience with Lacan sometimes, because it's too easy to move from Lacan to something completely outside, you know, like uh, Oh no! Yeah, no. I mean, I'm still not. I'm not saying the Nietzschean position, whatever. No, just no, no, no. There's a lot of good stuff in the context. No, no, no. It's, uh, it's not a defense of Lacan. It's a defense of patience. Okay? Sometimes it's really easy to, for example, you read Lacan seminars from seventy something, and then you read theory of the subject, for example. You can already see this very easy, the very direct God used theory of the subject. Okay? You can already read this. Like it's obvious that there's a, a lot of important stuff to be. Move from to move from one to the other, but in theory of the subject, especially, I think it's very interesting how the, how the the very way how the sexual disappears has to do with the way how the problem of strong and weak difference appears for him. I think a bit the, suddenly the whole problem of the phenomenon becomes mm. central, and you have this. Uh, he needs to define suddenly that uh, that there must be a, something almost like a fixed element much more closer to what Lacan would call the imaginary phallus than anything else, to pass from strong, strong to weak difference. So, uh, you know, it's sort of things, and then it appears again, uh, and then you have, you can have things like outplace and place in this binary thing, which has absolutely no, ex only, we have this force thing which you don't have access in the Lacanian sense, exactly, always struggling with that somehow. It's always, I think, it's, it's a question of, uh, Trying to ontologize, like, and really quickly, and, and let's let's remove sexual. Let's see if what is in that place can be removed for something else. Always can, by doing that, your the subject sense makes it very clear that. Uh, and then later on, he needs to account it again for different ways. You know, 
I don't think the sexual is just a, a question of uh, if it's structured like an event or something like that. Uh, yeah, I didn't mean but, to make but it sound more like, that. like what, uh, what is in that, for example, you could ask, I think the question of the sexual brings it more clo much closer to what is in every situation, which always makes, for example, fidelity this weird split thing, you know? Subtraction of a body's capacity to act. Yeah, I don't know, I'm very bad at criminology. <laughs> Separation uh, of a body to be. Yeah, you know, there's some, I don't know, it's. Uh, Here's my question for you. Is it possible to perhaps consider something else while still at the same time fully affirming Lacan? Do you I think if you fully it's affirm it's Lacan, not, but there will be question. no. Harm. I don't know. I mean, I just think, like, you know, what, what's at stake in the question of, uh, for example, perceptual and ontology? It's not so much a question of uh, if. Sec the, the question of the sexual has a structure of an event, for example. It's it's what does it change? That's kind of a structure of event. That's something that needs a lot more. <laughs> you, oh, the theory of the event. Sorry. We don't think that we're sorry. Sorry, uh, does it make, make more sense in that way? Oh, the theory, of the theory of the event. Well, yeah, I mean, I mean just, it's just. I mean, it's, it's what more an event is is obviously not anything simply stated. But of course, it's, it's just indulge me then the, the ignorance you. of. Sorry, I mean, then we can do something with it, I hope. But uh, my point is just that uh, I don't think it's so much of, uh, you know, like, we're too close to Lacan still a bit. It's hard to, to already... No, but I, I don't think we should turn now to this to some kind of uh, uh, struggle. I mean, I, I don't know. No, of course, no, of course. In, in, in the sense of the struggle, yeah. yes, but not in the sense of, uh, uh, I mean, uh, it's, there are absolutely choices to be made in philosophy. I mean, it's clear that and there are conceptual choices and they, it's clear that they, they take in one way, kind of, it misses the other, but at the same time, it's also true that, uh, okay, one can, okay, one can perhaps for, uh, fully affirm Lacan and still accept something else. I don't think why this would not be possible. I think it is at the same time very important not simply to affirm Lacan and say, okay, Good, and now we move to something different, but also try to see how also this different can perhaps be uh, a way of continuing of affirming Lacan. Because for me, this is, what is interesting is not simply, I mean, it might seem so, but I'm really not selling you here some kind of a generally accepted Lacanian doxa. I'm trying to make something out of what I put in a kind of, it's clearly in debate with all different kinds of theories and uh, philosophy that are. When gone, what uh, where I think that uh, going back to Lacan at some point can perhaps make a difference in this or that debate, and so it's not simply trying to say, okay, this is a Lacan, now we accept it or not, or affirm it or not, but affirm it only in the way of, but what exactly can we do with it now, or can we or can we not? And so in this sense, this is what interests me, and I think the precisely the uh, at the same time encounter and missed encounter between uh, Badiou and Lacan is one of the really more productive ones. I mean, it's clear that, I mean, okay, the, the difference of, uh, of age is clearly, it's not to say that Lacan was uh, kind of influenced by Badiou, but it's, it's clearly, I mean, the, the way I think uh, it is true that many, many things that were very, very much forgotten by uh, psychoanalysts and Lacanians about what is crucial in the uh, were brought forward by Badiou. And this is clear also by starting from something else, and perhaps sometimes from very different considerations, uh, that he was able to see something or to uh, kind of remind of something which is absolutely crucial and was, uh, in this sense, uh, swept under the carpet. But this said, nevertheless, I think that, that there are, uh, of course, there are some fundamental differences, of course, I think. In this sense, yeah, both sides will fight for, uh, <laughs> to a certain extent, the, the, the prove the there were uh, consistency, productivity of this or that approach. But uh, I, I just don't want this to turn in a kind of a uh, no, no, I wasn't even really no. one. <coughs> no, 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 we're friends. We're good. <laughs> Until next, yeah. Until <laughs> next class. Get somebody to drink your coffee. <laughs> no, but because I really think that there are, there are uh, lines, as you all know, I mean, there are fronts that need to be, uh, that really need to be fought, and perhaps this is not the, uh, in the sense of the, no, that ca really count and politically and conceptually as a more, uh, that have more, uh, yeah, 
this one is this one precisely is a product of one, but there are some where one needs to be more hostile <laughs> 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 from here on it's the end of the discussion. Okay, so